awake to the sight of serene blue skies. But something's not quite right. The sound of wind rushing past your ears and the unnerving sensation of falling is your first clue. Hold on, you were in a plane when you went to sleep. Great Scott, you're plummeting towards the earth. What are you going to do? I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths and the facts from the misconceptions. There are a couple of different scenarios you could find yourself in when hurtling towards the ground from heights of 35,000 feet. You'll most likely either be attached to your seat or an assortment of parts of the plane's fuselage, maybe a piece of the tail or a bit of the wing. Or, alternatively, you'll be free-falling solo. I realized that being in free fall would technically mean that you encountered no air resistance, but this is widely considered the term to use for someone falling unaided from the sky. So, do you have any hope at all of surviving such a predicament? Or should you relax and achieve a sense of inner peace as you say goodbye to this world? Let's start with a scenario where you're still strapped into your seat, or have some part of the wreckage attached to you. To better your situation, your first thought might be to detach yourself as soon as you can, thinking the extra weight will only cause you to hit the ground with even greater impact. But surprisingly, you may be better off staying put. One incredible survival story is that of Vesna Volovich, who fell with a chunk of the plane's tail, including her seat and a catering trolley, after the plane exploded at 33,000 feet. After falling the distance, Vesna was lucky enough to land in a bunch of trees situated on a snowy hillside. As she crashed down, the trees are believed to have slowed her descent, and the snow cushioned her final impact. However, trees usually come with their own set of hazards, primarily skewering. The tail section that Vesna was in essentially acted as a cocoon as she smashed through the branches, although she still didn't exactly get off scot-free. Vesna suffered a cracked skull, broken legs, and three broken vertebrae. But she was alive, and eventually made a near-full recovery. Surviving this way gives you the extra kudos of the title Wreckage Rider. Unsurprisingly, Volovich holds the world record for the highest fall survived without a parachute. Whether you find yourself in free fall or attached to part of the falling fuselage, the thing you'll want to establish is your terminal velocity, which is the top speed you'll be at when you hit Earth. The two forces acting on you are air resistance, or drag, and gravity. As you fall, atmospheric molecules will collide with you in the opposite direction of your descent. This creates resistance to your free fall, called drag. The faster you fall, the more drag you create, and this eventually slows your acceleration all the way down to zero. At this point, you have achieved your terminal velocity, and will not fall any faster. The factors that will affect your terminal velocity are your weight, your size, and your orientation. When attached to wreckage, you'll need to factor in its bulk as well. If you were in freefall without any debris, the truth is it wouldn't matter whether you were falling from 5,000 feet or 35,000 feet, because it's estimated that the average human body will reach 99% of its terminal velocity after falling 1,880 feet which should take you between 13 and 14 seconds. This will give you a whopping top speed of around 124 miles per hour. But this depends heavily on your body falling flat. If you were in, say, a nosedive, you could hit speeds of between 260 and 270 miles per hour. Alternatively, what speed would you be falling if you were still attached to part of the plane as you plummeted towards the Earth? Well. This will obviously differ dramatically depending on the amount of wreckage you're attached to, its weight, and its surface area. If we use the size of an average car as a point of reference, then according to theoretical physicist Matthew Kleban, you would hit a terminal velocity of between 200 and 300 miles per hour. So it's your call whether you want to take advantage of the cocoon of the wreckage, despite the fact that you may hit the ground at a higher speed. There will be some viewers wondering whether you should unclasp your seatbelt and try jumping off of your wreckage in an attempt to counter your speed. If you are wondering this, then I'm guessing you haven't seen this video. That will explain why you shouldn't bother spending your precious seconds attempting such a stunt. Anyway, statistically speaking, thanks to the likes of Volovich, you are actually more likely to survive as a wreckage rider. This accounts for nearly two-thirds of the survival tally over those who survived an unaided freefall. So it may be worth staying put. But that doesn't mean if you find yourself going solo that you're resigned to certain death. Since the dawn of aviation, there have been a surprising amount of freefall survivors. 
but we'll get onto them shortly. Because before you've had a chance to make any actual decisions, you'll pass out. The oxygen at 35,000 feet is so thin that the hypoxia sets in and you'll be unconscious for a mile or so as you tumble uncontrollably towards the Earth. Another factor to consider at this altitude is the outside temperature. During our investigation, many people have questioned whether you'd freeze to death outside the plane. Well, at 35,000 feet, the average ambient temperature is around minus 54 degrees Celsius, or minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's pretty chilly. Take into account your fall rate, and the wind chill factor will take the temperature down towards minus 100 degrees C. But you are accelerating towards 125 miles per hour, so you'd fall through this temperature into warmer conditions below fairly quickly. If you're in free fall with no wreckage to protect you, then you're likely to suffer some frostbite, and in the worst case scenario, you could die from thermal shock. But in this scenario, you've been lucky enough to survive, and now you're awake. So let's set about reducing your falling speed as much as we can. You essentially want to create as much drag as possible. The more surface area you have, the more atmospheric molecules you will collide with, and the slower you will descend. So, spread your arms and legs out in a similar formation to how you envision a skydiver to do so. This is known as the box or arch shape, and it will not only slow you down, but give you a greater dynamic stability, preventing you from tumbling uncontrollably any further. Once you've managed to stabilize your fall, you can attempt the slow fall technique by pushing down on the wind with your arms and legs flattening out further. Many skydivers claim to reduce their fall rate by around 10 to 15% after employing techniques like this. Some of you may be wondering whether the clothes you're wearing could help reduce your speed. Well, baggier, heavier clothes with long sleeves and legs can help slow your descent. Numerous skydiving jumpsuits are specifically designed to provide more drag. With these types of suits, many skydivers claim to be able to reduce their fall rate from around 125 miles per hour or above down to between 100 and 110 miles per hour, depending on their size. However, most passengers aren't likely to be wearing one of these on your regular scheduled flight. If you were, well, you may as well go the whole nine yards and swap your hand luggage for a parachute. For most of us, you'll find the average sweatshirt or pair of jeans aren't designed with air resistance in mind, but you could still reduce your speed by around 10%. With our speed decelerated as much as we possibly can, it's now time to decide what to land on. Past survivors have landed on a whole host of different surfaces and lived to tell the tale. The longest unaided fall, i.e. in free fall with no wreckage or safety systems, was survived by Russian airman Ivan Chizov, who bailed from his plane at 22,000 feet as it was shot down in 1942. He lost consciousness and crashed landed on the edge of a ravine covered in three foot of snow and survived with a fractured pelvis and temporary spinal injury. Being in the middle of World War II, a lot more people were jumping from the sky than usual, so he was shortly followed by US Airman Alan McGee, who fell from 20,000 feet. He didn't experience quite such a soft landing. After losing consciousness, he crashed through the glass roof of a train station before hitting the stone floor. McGee suffered a broken right leg and ankle, a nearly severed right arm, and multiple shrapnel wounds from the glass, but survived to fight another day. Nicholas Alchemade followed in 1944, jumping from 18,000 feet, crashing through the branches of some pine trees before hitting a snow-covered forest floor. He hobbled away with nothing much more than a twisted knee. In 1971, Julianne Koepke survived falling two miles strapped only to her airline seat. But more recently, survival stories have been from skydives gone wrong. Michael Holmes, a seasoned skydiver who fell two miles after a parachute malfunction over Lake Topor in New Zealand, had only a blackberry bush to break his fall. In his case, the extra drag of the failed parachute reduced his speed to 80 miles per hour before impact, but the imprint of his body on the ground was still visible for weeks after the incident, and incredibly, he could recount every moment of his fall. When I was up above Lake Topor, I had a little bit of hope that I'd land in the water. But even then, the sensible part of me knew it wouldn't be alright, that I'd probably be knocked unconscious and, at best, drown. Towards the end, I thought I was headed towards the airfield car park. I thought I was going to hit the concrete and gravel, and be killed instantly. So, what would be the best surface to aim for? 
If, like Holmes, you think aiming for water is any better than hitting the car park, then I'm afraid you'd be wrong. Water doesn't really compress, so colliding with it at 124 miles per hour would smash your body in the same way as if you hit concrete. If water is the only option, however, then studies about bridge jump survivors indicate that a feet first entry offers the most survivable outcome. Your legs are likely to be shattered, but you may be able to doggy paddle to safety. Ah, and tense your butt cheeks closed, because a colonic irrigation blast at this speed is likely to do you internal damage that you won't be paddling away from. But if you can, aim for something other than water. Ulf Bjornstig from Umeå University in Sweden, who has co-authored studies on the risks of skydiving, says that a person who has hit terminal velocity will need at least half a meter of give or flexibility in the surface they hit to decelerate their speed enough to avoid fatal injuries. Thick snow, haystacks, bushes and grassy marshlands are your best bet, but even a plowed field has proved a lifesaver in the past. If you are about to collide with some trees, then the advice that skydivers follow when they come down in trees under normal conditions will also come in useful. Position your elbows to cover your midriff with your hands covering your face. This will protect your vital organs from being sliced open as you crash down through the branches. And keep your legs springy and together to absorb as much of the impact with the ground as possible. With your sights set on a desired surface, just how on earth are you going to steer yourself towards that spot on Earth? Luke Aikens demonstrated the plausibility of such a task in 2016, when he set the world record for a freefall from 25,000 feet into a 100 by 100 foot net suspended 20 stories above the ground. Yeah, I know that's a pretty niche world record, but how did he do it? Well, as we've established, skydivers use the box position to give themselves the most stability in freefall but this also allows them to control their movements in the air. Banking your arms essentially means you use them like the wings of a plane to steer yourself. Always start in the box position. To fly forward, pull your arms back slightly at the shoulders and straighten your legs. To go back, extend your arms and bend your knees. To steer right, twist your upper body slightly to the right, dipping your right shoulder. And twist it slightly to the left, dipping your left shoulder to steer left. This is obviously a lot easier said than done. But you needn't jump out of a plane to practice. There are vertical wind tunnels all over the world that simulate the conditions of freefall, where you can refine your skills should they ever be called upon. Depending on the height you're at, you can easily cover a few miles horizontally while in freefall. So don't despair if you think your desired landing spot is out of reach. The last stage of our epic journey is actually landing or more accurately, hitting the ground. Having been in the box position for the majority of your fall, it's now time to flip around and let your legs take the brunt of the impact. At 1,000 feet, prior to your collision with Earth, you'll have roughly six to 10 seconds to get yourself in the legs down position. This is what 1,000 feet looks like. Remember, keep your legs bent and springy and protect your midriff with your elbows and your face with your hands. And finally, if you've successfully managed all of that, then do your best to roll to the side on impact. This is suggested to offer protection to the aorta, the body's largest artery. Most people who fall from a height die because they fracture their spine near the top and so transect the aorta which carries blood out of the heart. As a side note, statistically, you are most likely to survive a fall from the cruising altitude of an airliner if you're a child. Why? Well, a study by the Federal Aviation Agency suggests that the disproportionately higher survival rate of children under the age of four may be due to the fact that their skeletons are more flexible, their subcutaneous fat levels are higher, meaning that their internal organs are more protected, and of course, they weigh less, which inevitably reduces their terminal velocity. But if you're over the age of four, which I imagine most of you are, then don't forget to take your newly acquired knowledge with you on your next flight, because you just don't know when you might need to call upon it. If you would like to work out your terminal velocity and find out what the highest survivable fall into water is, then visit our sponsors over at brilliant.org forward slash debunked, where you can sign up for a free account. 
Brilliant is an incredible resource of science-based problem-solving tasks, puzzles, and quizzes that will put your grey matter through its paces. Brilliant is offering the first 200 subscribers a 20% discount to access their premium content too. The support of partners like Brilliant enable us to keep making videos, so please head on over and check them out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.